This is lesson seven and eight. I'm putting both of these lessons together. It is on magnitude and estimating quantities. So first we're gonna take a look at powers of 10. So meaning just if 10 is our base and then looking at if we have exponents on that, what that looks like. So let's start with 10 to a power of negative five. We know from our work with exponents that this means I don't actually have five tens on the top, I have five tens on the bottom. And so if I actually multiply that out, I'd have one over 100,000, which if I actually calculate out, 0 0.00001 is that. Let's try 10 to a negative four, which we know is, is one over four tens. So that's one over 10,000, and that's gonna equal three zeros and then a one. Okay, let's keep going. You can start working ahead of me if you're already seeing a pattern. One over a thousand is 10 to a negative three, point zero zero one. 10 to a negative two, one over two tens, which is one over a hundred. And I know it's a hundred because I have two zeros here, two zeros here. One over negative one, one over one ten, which is just one tenth anyways. 0 0.01. Now let's go positive. 10 to a zero means we have zero. 10, so we just, that's actually just one. 10 to a positive one means we have one 10. 10 squared means we have two tens multiplied by itself, so that's 100. 10 cubed means we have three tens multiplied by itself, so that's 1,000. Four tens multiplied by itself for 10 to the fourth and five tens multiplied by themselves for 10 to the fifth. And hopefully you're seeing a pattern here of what's going on. So let's try some more extreme examples. Hopefully we were seeing that when we had a negative exponent, you're getting something smaller. And when you have a positive exponent, obviously you're getting something bigger. If you look back at the other ones, cause I don't wanna have to actually go through the whole thing of one over seven tens and multiplying that out, you might be looking at the ones we just did and said, well, whenever you have a negative, you have one less of that many zeros and then a one, okay? So what that would look like is you have six zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then a one. Because this negative seven says that the one is seven decimal places, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, behind the decimal, 10 to a negative 20. You can actually write this out if you want, but what this really means is that we're gonna have 19 zeros and then a one. And again, you can write that out if this doesn't really make that much sense to you. If I had 10 to a negative 34, it's gonna be 0 0.33 zeros and then a one. For those of you who do wanna write it out, I can go ahead and take some time to do that and the rest of you can skip ahead. So 10 to a negative 20, that would look like this. And then you have that one. Same thing for 10 to a negative 34. That means we have zero point and then 33 zeros because it's one less than this number. Then we have that one. So we have this pattern here. If, it, if it's negative, you have one less zeros. So seven became six zeros, 20 became 19 zeros, and 34 became 33 zeros. You, of course, can always do the long way putting one over that many tens, multiplying it out, changing it over to a decimal. But I think just knowing this rule will help a lot. And if you always forget this rule, you can always just look at really small examples to help you remember that. So the fact that we all know 10 to a negative one is one over 10, and we all know that that is 0 0.1. So one less than one is zero, so there's no zeros here. So just if you're forgetting this rule, try out a simple one in your head and that will remind you that, oh, we don't have one zero, we have zero zeros because it's one less. Now let's take a look at what's going on with the positive powers. So take a look back at the ones we already worked through, see if you can see what's going on there. With the positive powers, hopefully you notice that that's exactly how many zeros you have. So with the negative, it's one less, but with the positives, it's how many zeros you need. So let's take a simple one that we can already calculate. If we had 10 to a six power, that means I'm gonna have one and then six zeros. If I have 12, that means I'm gonna have a one and then 12 zeros. 10 to a positive 76 power means you're gonna have a one and then 76 zeros. You can write that out on your notes if you want to. I'm not going to. So 10 to a 76 power means you have a one 
followed by 76 zeros. So powers of tens are really nice because we can talk about how big or small things are. And there's a word for that. It's called magnitude. Magnitude is how big or small something is. And you can actually use powers of 10 to describe something's magnitude. So you might hear um, researchers talking about how atoms are, I'm going to make up a number because I don't know the actual one, like maybe 10 to a negative 24. Because saying that actual number is really time consuming. So it's easier to think in terms of the magnitude in those powers of 10. What if I had something times that power of 10? And some of you might look at this and be like, I've seen numbers like that and you probably know the name of it. That's actually our next lesson, that's lesson nine, but it's okay if you're thinking, oh my God, this is scientific notation. You are correct, this is scientific notation. But if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about that, that's our next lesson. So what if I had a number times a power of 10? What is this actual number? You see this a lot when you're reading science magazines and stuff like that, they'll talk about, oh, something was three times a power or times 10 to a 30 power. Well, what does that actually mean? So here we have two times 10 squared. So we still have a two, that hasn't gone anywhere. This 10 squared really means we have 100, right? Because that is what 10 times 10 is. So, and then what's 2 times 100? That's 200. So, right now it might not seem like this is shorter, but as I go through more examples, you'll see that writing it in a form like this can actually be a shorter way of writing really big or small numbers. What if we had 3 times 10 to a fourth? Well, that's 3 times 1 followed by 4 zeros just like our rule that we saw earlier. So that's 10,000. So it's three times 10,000, so that's 30,000. And now it's looking like this is a little bit more realistic to write three times 10 to the fourth and 30,000. What if we went bigger? Let's do seven times 10 to the seventh. Now this looks nice and tidy, but let's expand it out. Seven times one followed by seven zeros. So this is 10 million. So if I multiply this out, that's 70 million. And this number right here is longer than this. Not in actuality, but writing it out takes a lot longer than just writing this little tiny thing. It works really well for really, really big numbers. Now let's look at smaller numbers. And you should be thinking, okay, if we're talking about small numbers, we're talking about powers of tens that are negative. So let's try out a very simple one. What if I had two times 10 to a negative three? Well, we still have the two and it's gonna be two zeros because we have a three followed by a one. So that becomes 0 0.002. So that two thousandths. So right now again, because we're talking, this is a pretty small example, this may look about the same as this, but let's make it more extreme and we can start saying that this is definitely more efficient. What if we had six times 10 to a negative six? Oh, we got six. Our decimals followed by five zeros because it's one less than the six. Multiply that out, and when we're multiplying it out, really all you have to do is take that six and put it where the one is. So this number, writing this out, takes longer than it is to write this. Okay, let's do one more example, more extreme. Nine times 10 to the, let's do negative 14. You're already thinking, oh, this is gonna be a pain, and probably will be. So let's work through it together. Nine times, then we have 13 zeros, just that in general is already pretty nasty. Let's actually multiply it out. So replacing the one with the nine. So we still have our 13 zeros. Scientific notation, or just this method of using the magnitude times a number is a much more efficient way of writing really, really small numbers. And honestly, that number is actually not that small when you think about sizes of things in cells, in atoms. There are many, many way smaller things than that number. There is always a power 10 bigger than a number and there's always a power 10 smaller than a number. And the great thing about that is you can use it to estimate numbers. And the important thing about estimations is you use them whenever you don't care about the actual number. I may not actually care about the fact that I have 232 markers in my cabinet. I just wanna know that's like, okay, I have about 250. That's a good amount for me to estimate when I'm thinking about I have these projects coming up and stuff like that. So you use estimation whenever you don't care about the actual number. So if I had a number of 152, What's a power 10 less than this? And while we're starting out, it's okay to just kind of throw things out and then eliminate them. So let's throw out a couple. We have power of one, power of two, power of three, power of four. Now, 10 to a power one is just 10. 
That's definitely smaller than that. So let's keep it on the board for now. 10 to a power of two, well, that's 100. Oh, that's also smaller than this. So we can get rid of 10 to a power of one because that's too small. Oh, uh, this is pretty close. So I'm starting to think maybe this is the one that's bigger. Well, 10 to a power of three is one with three zeros. And oh, that is bigger. So I can actually get rid of this one. So this is the power of 10 that's smaller. And this is the power of 10 that's bigger. And some of you might be looking at this and be thinking, there's got to be an easier way of doing this instead of doing process of elimination. And you are absolutely correct. Guess and check is always a good method. But of course, we want to be more efficient with our work. We don't want to do more work than we have to. Take notice of this. There is three digits here. Now, the one that's smaller is 10 to a power of 2. The one that's bigger is 10 to a power of 3. So you might want to be thinking of, oh, there's three digits. So something 10 to a power of 3 is going to be bigger because you have three zeros. So there's actually four digits here, where something with the power of two is also three digits, so that's going to be smaller. So let's talk about the number 93,825. So maybe I'm still not quite that good at this, so I'm going to take a look at 10 to the power of five, because there's five digits here. So I'm going to take a look at 10 to the power of five. Well, 10 to the power of five is one followed by five zeros. So that's 100,000. Oh, that's bigger. So if I go one down, that's smaller. So let's look at another example now that we're getting a little bit better at this. 1,375. There are four digits there. So 10 to the power of four is going to be bigger. And 10 to the power of three is going to be smaller. So let's get up here a general rule for this. Bigger power of tens have the same power as the number as digits. So like how this had five digits, so the bigger one had a power of five. Or that one had four digits, so the bigger number had a power of four. All right, let's write the rule for smaller. Smaller powers of 10 have one less power than the number of digits. So this was five digits. The smaller one has four as an exponent. That one was four digits, so the smaller power has an exponent of three. And it might be hard to remember both of them, so I'd say just remember the bigger one, and then it's easy to go, well, obviously the smaller one is one less. Now, what if we had negative powers? So what if we're talking about decimals? Do these still hold up? Well, let's take a look. So what's the power that's below this, and what's the power that's above this? So let's use guess and check, because we haven't dealt with decimals yet, so it's easy to go back to what we thought before. Let's try the same thing. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to guess. 10 to a negative 2. There's two positions behind. I may guess that 10 to a negative 2 should be one of the numbers, bigger or smaller. So let's expand this and see which one it is. 10 to a negative 2, we know means that you have one zero and then a 1. Oh, that's less. So do we need to go up as in make it 10 to a negative 1, or do we want to go more as in 3? Well, let's try out both of them and see which one it is. So here we have 0 0.1, well that's definitely bigger, 0 0.001, oh that's smaller. So this is the one immediately bigger, and this is the one immediately smaller. So it seems like our rules only apply, these ones that we wrote up, only apply for the positive powers. So let's write up these new rules for these negative exponents. So the bigger one has an exponent one less than how many places. Now, is that the way we want to write it? Or maybe we want to write it that the bigger one has as many zeros as it has. That's probably the easier way of thinking it. So here, the bigger one was one, negative one, and here there's one zero. So then the, le the one less is one less. Okay? You guys have to remember that one less when you go negative, the actual number gets bigger because you're getting more in debt. So let's just start with the bigger one, and then you can always find the smaller one, because thinking it's one less. So let's try another example and see if these hold up. Let's start with the bigger power. So the bigger power of 10 has the same negative exponent, negative exponent, as the number of zeros. So this one should be to a negative third power should be the bigger. Let's take a look at that. That means we have 0 0.2 decimals and a 1. And yep, that's definitely bigger. 0 0.001 is bigger than 0 0.000. And so now we need to think the smaller power has one less than the bigger power. And remember, when we go less with a negative, it becomes more negative. So the actual digit, the actual number becomes more. So this should be the smaller one. And let's, let's test out. Let's make sure it is correct. So this would be three zeros 
fall by one. And yeah, that definitely is. So you have to remember when you're dealing with decimals, you really want to pay attention to that first digit. These other ones are kind of talking about how close we are getting to this next number. So these are like, hey, we're actually pretty close to this being a four, but we can kind of almost ignore them. We really only care about this first number. And so when we compare this one to this one, they have the same amount of decimals, but three is bigger than one. So this rule that we wrote holds up again. Now, again, remember, we care about the first actual number. We don't care about how many digits there are. All these are saying is how close we are to turning this into a two. The bigger power of 10 has the same negative exponent as the number of zeros. So we have a negative exponent in the same amount as the number of zeros. Well, there are no zeros. So that would be a zero. And some of you are like, well, there can't be a negative zero. And you're right, so let's rewrite that as 10 to a zero. So, but 10 to a zero is one. Is that bigger than that number? Absolutely. Any fraction is less than one, so this is definitely bigger. Let's try our smaller one now, which means we're gonna need one less than that number. What's one less than zero? Negative one, which actually is 0 0.1. And this number is less, because we, this number has all these other numbers to back it up saying that, well, actually this is closer to two, and this one's just regular 0.1. So this one is smaller. Now we're gonna take a look at using magnitudes, powers of 10, to estimate really, really big numbers so that we can compare them. Because right? it makes it so your calculations, you can deal with just the powers of 10, so you don't have to deal with the real numbers, because sometimes they're really annoying. So the average household just owes $15,000 from credit cards. We're not talking mortgage and all student loans, all that extra stuff, just from credit cards. Now, the national debt, what our country owes, and this has probably gone up since I looked it up. Gosh, what is that number even? That is 18,388,603,567,287 dollars. If I wanted to say how much bigger, how many times bigger is this debt? than your household credit card debt. Yes, we can pull out our calculators and plug these in, but some of our calculators actually can't even hold that many numbers on our screen, so you'll probably get an error message, or you get this really nasty debt um, number that you don't even know what it means, and let me just put this on the board, please don't write it down, the actual amount. I mean, you can write this on your notes if you really, really want to, but oh my goodness. And there's a nasty decimal after that. So it's actually 1,170,801,194 point stuff times bigger. Not just like amount bigger, times bigger. So you have to multiply our debt by this to get the national debt. Whew. We're definitely talking about big numbers here. So thank goodness we know how to use powers of 10 to make these numbers look a little bit smaller, more manageable. So let's change these numbers to, having, to being powers of 10. Now, again, this is gonna be an estimate. So that's why we can change these to being powers of 10 because we don't actually care about the actual amount. We just want like a good estimate. So let's change 15,706 our household credit card debt to a power of 10. And sorry that I'm off the screen. When you think how many digits are here, so the easiest thing to think about is just to, to round it. Just round it to the nearest power of 10. So I'm gonna just round it down to 10,000. And I know you're thinking, well, that's actually a really low estimate of that amount. And that's okay, we're doing an estimate. So this can be changed to 10 to the power of four because there's four zeros. Now let's change this national debt. In this national debt, you wanna think that we're gonna be rounding it down again because we just wanna change it to the power of 10. So we're actually gonna be changing it to whatever 10 trillion. We're actually gonna be rounding it down to 10 trillion. So if we change that to a power of 10, which I mean, when you're dealing with these numbers, this is a lot better, a lot easier to deal with just a simple 10 to some power. Well, we gotta know how many zeros are there. So there's 13 zeros. So now doing this, it's a lot easier to say we're dealing with 10 to the 13 and 10 to the power four opposed to these actual numbers, okay? Just in the amount of time it takes to say them, it's a lot faster. So we're gonna be comparing 10 to a 13 to 10 to the four. And a lot of you are looking at this like, oh, I know that kind of problem. We've been doing a lot with those kinds of problems. And that's exactly why we do exponents before these lessons, because these, those same things apply. So now that we change this to powers of 10, they're just exponents and we can just do the quotient rule right here because we're just taking that big number, dividing it by that small number to get how many times bigger it is. So 
10 to the 13 divided by 10 to the 4th. By our quotient rule, we do 13 minus 4. So that's a 10 to a power of 9. So the national debt is 10 to the 9th power bigger than the credit card debt. Now, again, that was an estimate. Look, how, Let's take a look at how close that actually was to the actual. Now, 10 to a power of 9 means we have a 1 followed by 9 zeros. And take a look at that. That's actually pretty close. We got the same number up front, same amount of space essentially. It's like you just took all this and erased it. So it's actually pretty close. That's a pretty good estimate, especially considering that I know most of you probably were not comfortable with the fact that we rounded both numbers down by so much. I have one more example of these. I promise the numbers are smaller. I just want to show you why we use powers of 10 because when numbers are ridiculous, it's easier to work with powers of 10. So here we have the population of some city in 1723 was 7,248. And the population in that same city in 1870 was of course a lot more, 942,292. So these numbers aren't as big. We could just throw that into our calculator if we wanted to. But if I don't have a calculator, I can just do the powers of 10, just like before. I purposely chose numbers that are pretty big numbers as far as the first digits. Because we know from whenever we learned rounding, what, like third grade, fourth grade, that if that number is bigger than five, you can round up. So what I would actually suggest, instead of just rounding this to, down to 1,000, because we know that would be a really low estimate, let's round this up to 10,000, which then if we change to power of 10, there's four digits there. This next one, again, nine is really, really close to it becoming 10. So let's just round this whole thing up. So we'll round it up to one million. There's six zeros there, so it's 10 to the power of six. Now that they're in much simpler form, it's really easy to compare them. So let's calculate how much bigger, how many times bigger it, the population was in 1870 than it was in 1723. So we're gonna take our bigger number, 10 to a six, put it over our smaller number, and we just have the quotient rule again. So it's 10 squared, okay? And since 10 squared is a really small number, if you wanted to, you could be like, all right, it's 100 times bigger. And there you go, that's it. So comparing numbers, actual numbers, you can just convert it to their magnitude to the power of 10 that they're closest to, divide them up, and then that's how many times bigger that bigger number is than that smaller number. And we'll go over I think at least one more example of this in class, if not two. So we're gonna convert some numbers to be written as a number times a power of 10. So we're ju I'm just gonna put up some numbers and I'm gonna show you how to convert them to being a number times a power of 10. That's the same format I showed you earlier and that's actually working towards our next lesson, which is scientific notation. So what if we had 0 0.003? That first number, let's just take that three. Because we can't just get rid of that three. We're not making an estimate. We're actually doing an actual amount. We're just converting how it looks. So we got a three, and we know we need it times a power of 10. But the question is what power goes there? Well, I'm thinking it needs to be a negative power because this is a decimal. But then what should go there? Well, if you remember back to our rule, the power of 10 was one less than the amount of zeros. So there's two zeros, so if I do one less, it should be three. The other way of thinking about this, and for some of you, this will be the easier way of thinking about it, and this is actually how I normally think about it, is think about how many times I need to move the decimal so that this becomes a regular three. So like if I move the decimal once, twice, three times, then that three becomes a regular three. Let's take a look at another example. Maybe I have, I wanna turn 0. .00007, into a number times a power of 10. Well, we gotta keep that seven. We know it's times a 10. Then what should that power be? Now we could do the rule way of counting up, well, there's four zeros, so I need to go one less, so it needs to be negative five, or we can count up how many places, and that's five. So either way, you get to that negative five. Let's try positive numbers now. What if I had 80,000? Well, let's, let's keep that eight. And then it's times some power of 10. So we're, we're almost there. We're, we're just missing that exponent. Then you can think back to our rule before of how to expand it as, well, there's four zeros. So we can put a power of four or we can count the decimals again. All whole numbers have a decimal right at the end, even if we don't write it. So you can think, well, how many times do we have to move it forward to make this 80,000 just a regular eight? So once again, that counting that decimal holds up. Let's try another example. Seven million. Keep that seven. And we need times 10 to some power. You can either look in this and be like, huh, 
there's six zeros. Alrighty, let's write a six. Or, which again, remember, that only works with positive exponents, so these have to be numbers greater than zero. Or we can count the decimals, so that holds up again. Here comes the part where we get to see how our calculators tend to fail us when we are working with these numbers. And this is one of the reasons why I always tell you, yes, you can use your calculator, but it probably won't help you. 10 to the 40th power into your calculator, which for some of you means you need to push, put in 10, and then there's like a little carrot button, and then you push in 45. For others of you, that means you um, push 10, and then there's this little symbol that says y to an x, and then you push in 45. And I can always help you with this if you just really don't understand what I mean, or you don't have access to a calculator, don't worry about it. You can leave this part blank and just write down what we show you at the end. So if I put in 10 to a power of 45, I get, and this everyone's calculator is different. My personal calculator right here just says, one decimal and you got a 45. Well, that doesn't look like the same thing. Some of your calculators will say 1e plus 45. Well, that doesn't look like the same thing. And some of yours will just give you an error message. So just to let you know how to distinguish what your calculator is saying, you do need to get familiar with your calculator if you're going to be doing stuff like this. Of course, I'm showing you all the ways how to do it without your calculator. But if your calculator is giving you this, it's showing you scientific notation. It's showing you that this is actually means 1 times 10 to a 45. It's about 10. Same thing down here. This is saying, oh, we have a 1 times 10 to a 45. And we know that 1 times 10 to a 45 is the same thing as just 10 to a 45, because multiplying things by 1 doesn't change the identity, doesn't change what we're talking about. So this is just to get you familiar with the fact that your calculators are going to start saying different things than what you think they're saying. They are saying 10 to a 45, just not in a way that you're familiar with. So part of this unit is getting used to how technology represents powers, really, really big or really, really small powers. Let's try one other and just see how our calculators fail us. Let's try a negative exponent. So go ahead and put in 10 to a negative 12 into your calculator and see what it comes up with. Some of your calculators can actually do it. Some will say one decimal negative 12, which means Oh, hey, I have 1 times 10 to a negative 12. Others will say 0, because your decimal is telling you that this number is so small, let's just chalk it up to 0. It's, it's, it's too small. We don't care anymore. It's just 0. And some of yours will just say error, and that's, that's, that's just what it's going to say. So you want to get familiar with your calculator so that when you plug these things in, you don't just write this down and think that that's an okay answer. We're dealing with these sort of numbers now. I don't want to just, I don't want to see these unless it's asking you to do that. And that's it for lesson seven through eight.